and you know he would talk to me about what he did for a living and I you know kind of had a growing interest with my interactions with this particular person at my church so I would say he was my first role model and mentor as far as um, my interest in medicine was concerned and with my growing interest I decided to take part in some summer camps uh, that were geared towards introducing uh, pre-college high school students to the field of medicine and that's kind of where my uh, desire to go into uh, college as a pre-med student was ignited. So my undergraduate background uh, starts at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a very large public institution there and um, it's growing by the year. So that's where I had my footing in my pre-med uh, and career. My major was in biology with a pre-med concentration, obviously. Uh, but as you probably heard from many of the physicians who have given talks is that when it comes to medicine, you, know, don't, you don't have to major in a science field like biology, chemistry, or physics. You can major in any uh, topic that you would like to have more interest in, like Spanish, English, dance, music, uh, with a pre-med concentration so that you complete your prerequisites for medical school. It actually kind of sets you apart from those who don't have science majors when you do major in a non-science field. Uh, while I was in uh, my undergraduate institution, I did spend time uh, volunteering at the Grady Memorial Hospital Emergency Room, which is one of the busiest level one trauma centers in the country. It's right, out, right outside of one of the major interstates in the center of Atlanta, Georgia. And that was my first introduction to um, emergency medicine in general. It was, a, And that was my first um, time that I realized I didn't want to be an emergency physician. So it was kind of good that I got that experience uh, at Grady Memorial Hospital. I also spent some time working with a primary care physician in the Atlanta area. And that one-on-one -on -one time was uh, a good time for me to get to under know and understand what it takes to be a primary care doctor. And I was also able to receive my first letter of recommendation from that physician. And with that, I was a busy undergrad student. I spent a lot of time working. I paid for college out of pocket. I did take out student loans at the same time, but I did spend some time working at um, fast food, Quizno subs. And then when the Georgia Aquariums was um, erupted uh, in Atlanta, I did spend some time working in the banquet catering hall there. So I was always busy doing something uh, while I was an undergraduate student. So as far as medical school is concerned, I went to the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia, my hometown. Um, that school is the only public school in Georgia, but it graduates the largest number of physicians in the state. And as you can see by the photo, the Augusta is where the main campus is located uh, on along the east border of the state. But we or the institution has um, sites in other cities around the Georgia area uh, where you can uh, finish up your third and fourth year rotations. And then Athens, Georgia, where UGA is, uh, they do have a first through fourth year uh, um, remote school that is affiliated with the main cap campus and is continuing to grow and reach out to other parts of the state. Now, as a medical student, I did not know I was interested in dermatology when I first started. I thought I was going to be an internist or, um, you know, family medicine physician because that's the only thing I've really been exposed to um, growing up. And after spending time in my third and fourth year, or actually my third year rotations, I realized that I didn't really, my personality didn't really fit primary care. I want to be more of a specialist in my field. And then after talking with other mentors um, in other specialties, they actually uh, suggested I look into dermatology. I hadn't even, it hadn't even been on my radar at the time. So I did spend time in our uh, shadowing some of the residents and attendings at the dermatology residency program at MTG, where I kind of just fell in love with the specialty. And I made sure my third year elective was in dermatology so I could spend more time just trying to make sure it's exactly something I wanted to pursue because I knew it was competitive to get in. And after spending that rotation there, I decided to kind of just be gung-ho and focus on uh, making getting into dermatology residency my goal. So during my third and fourth year rotations, I made sure I uh, did some away rotations outside of Augusta, because when you apply to dermatology residency, most of us apply to all of the dermatology residency programs. And that's, from what I remember, about 105 programs. I'm sure there's a couple more out there now. 
And when you apply to all of those programs, the average interview rate is about 10% of the programs you apply to. So if you apply to 100 programs, you should expect to get at least 10 interviews out of those 100 programs. So it's a very low interview rate versus primary care. If you apply to 100 primary care residency programs, you'll probably get a good number of interview, um, interview um, from those programs. So dermatology is super, super competitive and almost everyone who applies are highly qualified to be dermatologists. So they're looking at your board scores or looking at your undergraduate, um, your, not your undergraduate, excuse me, your GPA medical school. They're looking at your rotations that you did, your letters of recommendation. They're looking at your application as a whole, but because it is so competitive, some programs will look at your board scores, your step one and step two, primarily your step one, and we'll set a cutoff rate for your step one um, board exam. And if you don't re reach that cutoff number, then they won't even look at your application. Um, but on the other hand, there are several programs who won't even use a cutoff number for your, your board scores and will you know, we'll use other measures of you know, deciding who they're gonna in in interview. And the reason why I did so many array rotations during my third and fourth year of medical school is because when you do rotate through a program, you get to know the residents there, you get to know the attendings at those programs. So they're more likely to offer you an interview when they already have had time to get to know you as a person. And at the end of the day, they want to interview people who are a good fit for their program. And they will not interview you if you did an away rotation and you had a bad attitude, you showed up late, you got in the way, like they're, they're just not gonna bring you back for an interview. So if you do do an away rotation, you wanna make sure that you have your best foot forward at all times. So I went to Medical College of Georgia for residency. So I ended up uh, staying at my primary, my medical school institution for my um, residency. I did go to uh, Savannah for my internship. I did an internship in internal medicine, which is, was, which is a year long after you finish medical school. And then after your one year internship, then you enter your three year residency for dermatology. So I moved from Augusta to Savannah for a year finish my program and then move back to Augusta to finish my residency. So the Medical College of Georgia is a uh, dermatology, the dermatology residency there is nine residents total, which is about average for a derm residency size. Some are larger and have about 15 residents and some are smaller and have only three residents total. So that's another reason why it's very competitive because our programs tend to be on the more intimate side. So there's smaller slots or there's less slots for, for you to get into uh, when it comes to during residency. So there are three residents per year, total of nine residents at MCG. And the purpose of, of residency is to become an expert in your field. You know, dermatologists are experts of the hair, skin, and nails. And we spend an average of 15,000 hours of training um, with your colleagues, with your attendings who are board certified dermatologists. And when you don't, when you are done with residency, you have an exam to take, which is your the ultimate board exam, which tests everything you learned during your during residency. And we are tested on uh, dermatopathology, surgical dermatology, medical dermatology, cosmetic dermatology. Uh, so it, it is a pretty, um, it's an eight, hour, an eight hour long exam. And if you fail, then you are not board certified. You still can practice medicine as a dermatologist, but you cannot use that FAAD, which is, stands for Fellow of American Academy of Dermatology. That is the, the designation for being a board certified dermatologist. And I can speak a little bit more about that in the next few slides. So this is just a pictorial representation of the, the overall journey of becoming a dermatologist. You start with four years of uh, undergraduate institution. You get your prerequisites for medical school, then four years in medical school to become an MD or a DO if you choose to go to a DO or osteopathic uh, medical school. And then when you're done with medical school, you go into your internship for a year. Uh, as I mentioned, I did a year in, in internal medicine, but you can do a year in pediatric surgery or what they call a transitional year where you pretty much rotate through different specialties. It's kind of like a year long, um, third year rotation in a way, but you rotate through primary care and, and other specialties. 
Um, but I enjoy my year in medicine uh, because when it comes to dermatology, you'll find that a lot of the things that we treat can be a result of um, diseases that can lead to skin changes. So having that, that background in internal medicine can help you in a way become a better dermatologist. But if you don't do a year in medicine, it's okay. You can, you'll still be a great dermatologist either way. And when, when you finish your year internship, you'll have your three years dermatology residency minimum. And then beyond that, if you decide to subspecialize within dermatology, you can go on to do a year long fellowship as a dermatopathologist a MO surgeon or a pediatric dermatologist. So those three are, as I mentioned, the subspecialties within dermatology. And once you are done with that year long fellowship, then you can um, become board certified in either three of those fields. So a dermatopathologist is a pathologist who specializes in reading slides that are specific to the skin. So whenever I do a biopsy in clinic, I send my past specimens to a dermatopathologist to read because it, when it comes to the skin, there are so many different things that can happen on a microscopic level with the skin. And a pathologist does get training in um, looking at the skin underneath the microscope, but they also kind of train and look at the, the, the gut, the pancreas, the liver, the brain, like they are uh, jack of all trades. So the battle pathologist, is this, that is all they do. They just read slides um, specifically for the skin. So you can go on to do that. Uh, a Mohs surgeon is a dermatologist who specializes in Mohs surgery, which is a procedure where they remove skin cancers from cosmetically sensitive areas. So a person who grows a skin cancer on the lip or the nose or the ear, they remove as little tissue as possible to clear the skin cancer. And they are actually trained to look underneath the microscope at the tissue that they remove and determine if all the margins are clear of the skin cancer. And if any of those margins are positive, then they will mark it and go back to the patient and make sure they remove just that particular area where the skin cancer is positive, making sure to remove as little skin as possible to sew the patient back together and make them look normal again. So that's what they do. And then you have your pediatric dermatologists who specialize in uh, just being a dermatologist for the kiddos. Um, they are a number of genetic conditions that can result in uh, numerous skin disorders, some that are, are debilitating to those who have it. And um, derm pediatric dermatologists also specialize in tumors that are found in children that can be treated in a way that's very, very specific uh, to approaching children. So usually you find pediatric dermatologists at academic institutions uh, where they serve on faculty and um, dermatologists from the area, private dermatologists send patients to pediatric dermatologists when there's a condition that we're just not that familiar with treating. You learn about it, but because we don't see it as often, we tend to like to send those patients to the, spe the specialist so that they can um, handle them appropriately. So trust your care to the experts. This is a slide that I took from the American Academy of Dermatology website that just kind of gives a very brief uh, comparison of what it takes to be a board certified dermatologist versus what it takes to be a physician assistant or nurse practitioner who may practice dermatology. And I, and I often get times get questions from even pre-med students who are like, well, why, why go into all this debt to become a physician when I could just be a PA or a nurse practitioner and finish sooner and still practice dermatology? Well, there's a huge difference. And, you know, of course, the level of medical education and training is much shorter for a PA or an MP, and the required patient hours are, you know, pale in comparison to the amount of hours that we get in training uh, to become experts in what we do. And then on top of that, to be a board certified dermatologist, we have to pass our board exams demonstrating um, thorough knowledge of all aspects of dermatology. There is no exam that's comparable to that, to that for PAs or MPs. And you know, PAs and MPs in most states practice underneath a board certified or just a dermatologist. So, you know, the level of training is different. And, you know, there's nothing, certainly nothing wrong with being a PA or MP, uh, though dermatologists employ them to increase access to, to care for patients who need to get in at the last minute, who have conditions that aren't um, as urgent or as complex that they, uh, we feel comfortable with them handling. So there's a place 
for uh, those individuals, but there is a difference too. And it's important to understand that difference and to uh, make sure lay, the lay public understands that too. Because I think a lot of patients go in to, be, to see PAs and NPs and they assume that they are doctors when they are not, and that can be confusing. So a day in the life of a dermatologist, um, as you most of you may know, is an outpatient-based specialty, meaning we do not spend time much time at, in the hospital. Uh, some of us do practice inpatient dermatology where we are on call to see patients with um, urgent or life-threatening skin conditions, and they do exist. Um, at my institution, I do take call uh, for a month and we rotate each month amongst all the, the dermatologists to be on call for the emergency room and the urgent care um, center that, um, was, that is within our hospital or you know, institution. But as an outpatient physician, I, my hours are eight to five and I see um, about 30 patients a day. And that includes phone calls, going over results, going over labs, um, responding to patient emails, which I get a ton of every day. So it, it, can, it can add up the amount of patients that you are seeing and interacting with. And some outpatient dermatologists will see 60 plus patients a day. So it is a very fast paced environment and we are often, often bouncing from room to room uh, seeing patients. So it's, there's never a dull moment. There's always something going on in the derm clinic. And one of the things I love about what I do is that there's immediate satisfaction. Patients are typically, they come in with an issue, you, pre you prescribe the appropriate medications, typically their skin issue is, can be you know, essentially cured within a few days to a week or two. Of course, there are several conditions that are chronic in nature and require um, months to years to manage, but um, I love the immediate satisfaction that comes with some of the things that we do as a dermatologist. So some of the top skin conditions that I see in my office include acne, hyperpigmentation, rashes to include eczema, atopic dermatitis, hair loss is really common, um, seborrheic dermatitis, hydrinitis superativa, tons of dry skin, especially in the wintertime, um, warts, moles, and yeasts, and slash fungal infections, and even bacterial infections. And I'll have a few photos to show you um, after this slide of some of those conditions. So we are all mostly familiar with acne. I'm sure we've all had at least one acne bump in our lifetime. And I like to kind of share with you pictures of two different, very different skin types. Uh, patients with skin of color can have acne that tends to leave more dark spots behind. And then more fair skin patients can have acne that tends to leave more red spots behind. And it's very important to understand that in patients of color, that even if you don't see any active acne lesions, the hyperpigmentation that can result from an uh, acne lesion that has healed month, months ago can last for months to even years if not treated adequately. So we call that post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And, and it's as I saw, as we mentioned in the last slide, it's one of the very common um, things I treat in my practice, just dark spots from where rashes and acne bumps have healed. So when it comes to treating acne, um, we use a variety of medications, including topical or retinoids, topical or oral antibiotics, and even anti-inflammatory washes to calm this down. Um, but for some patients, especially women, acne can have a very strong hormonal component that can flare around uh, menstrual cycles. So there are medications that we use to control the hormonal fluctuations that can also help with controlling the acne breakout. And then there's a bacterial component. P. acne is a bacteria that we find on the skin and acne patients that can also be part of that inflammatory process that can lead to the pustules and papules and um, blackheads and white heads and red and dark spots on the skin uh, when an acne bump forms and goes away. Another common co condition I see in my clinic is atopic dermatitis, uh, which is a rash that is found in children and can be persisted into teenage years and even adult years. And it's characterized by erythematous or red patches that you can see in the intratriginous sites or the folds of the arms, back of the legs, the neck, the ears, and various other places on the body. And again, I just want you guys to kind of just kind of this more of an introduction to skin of color and how 
rashes can appear differently in those of darker skin types. Here on the left, you see a fair skinned person where the red is very visible, but on the right, same rash, except that the skin is darker where the eczema is present and less red in appearance. And in some darker skinned folks, red can look purple uh, on exam. So it's when it comes to dermatology, if, you know, if you decide to take that route, you'll learn in residency that there are patterns to all of our skin conditions. So if, you've, if the rash is popping up in certain areas, it should have you thinking of a couple, narrow it down to a couple of diagnoses of things that it could be. So as I mentioned, it's a very common inflammatory skin condition and it's a complex condition as well. Um, there are genetic predispositions to having atopic dermatitis. There are environmental influences that can flare eczema for these patients. And it can be very itchy. It can be acute and chronic and relapse and, and go into remission throughout various times of the year. Um, so it, it's a condition that's approached in different ways. Um, but typically it involves a combination of different modalities of treating it and managing it for these patients, including avoidance of triggers, um, like certain allergies can trigger patients to itch and their eczema to flare, using moisturizers, topical steroids, or anti-inflammatory medications for those who have really severe disease, and even something called phototherapy, which is a light, um, which is, uses UV light to treat um, their eczema. And just another photo of, of a, a patch of eczema on a patient's skin. Now this may not be atopic dermatitis per se, this could be a contact dermatitis from someone wearing a watch band, like a Fitbit or Apple watch, and they're allergic to the band. It can cause a rash like this to develop. And if it's not treated adequately, it can be, become thick, dry, scaly, and harder to treat the longer it's there. And hand eczema can look like this. It doesn't necessarily have to be a erythematous or hyperpigmented patch on the skin. It can be blisters underneath the skin. And the name for this is dyshydrotic eczema. And dyshydrosis just means to kind of bubble up. It's a Latin term for bubbling up in the skin. And I, I see this very often in patients who have hand eczema and are washing their hands a lot, especially in the winter time, especially with, in a pandemic where everyone's trying to keep their hands clean. Um, hand eczema is it's very, very common. And for those who had atopic dermatitis as a kid, typically as an adult, they have more hand eczema just from all the exposures over time to their skin. And eczema on the bottom of the feet, size of the feet. Um, for some patients, they can be allergic to product in their shoes, rubber, textiles can be an issue. Um, putting powder in your shoes might irritate the skin for some folks. So um, eczema can pop up anywhere you have skin. Hair loss and hair thinning is a very common thing I see in my practice too. Um, hair loss and thinning can occur with age. And this is a, a picture of someone with female pattern hair loss, probably a mixture of female parent pattern hair loss and an acute hair loss condition called telogen and effluvium which you can see in patients who are acutely ill, hospitalized, or overcoming a, a severe illness. And you tend to see diffuse, diffuse hair thinning and hair loss throughout the scalp, which can be accentuated at the frontal portions of the scalp, as you see in this patient. And we ca typically call it androgenetic alopecia when it's more kind of a alopecia or hair loss that you see with age. And the hair follicles are very sensitive to male hormones in the skin. So as you age, the male hormone testosterone is converted to dihydrotestosterone in the scalp and the follicles in the scalp can become very sensitive to dihydrotestosterone over time. And in men and in women that can lead to hair loss and thinning at the vertex or the very top of the scalp and um, the front of the scalp where you see widening of the hairline. And for some people, they see this triangular alopecia on the temples of the scalp um, with, with age as well. And typically we manage that with anti-androgen or anti-male hormone medications to help slow um, that hair loss. But you know, genetically you're just predetermined for it to happen. So there's nothing I can do to stop it, but I can certainly slow it down and, and try to keep as much hair on your head as possible. This is another type of alopecia called alopecia areata. And the way you, again, we're going back to patterns of hair loss. 
this hair loss condition leads to smooth patches of hair loss on the skin and a very round co configuration where you see an abrupt start and stop to where the hair loss is, is appreciated. And this is a non-scarring hair loss, meaning that the hair will grow back once you stop the inflammatory process leading to the hair loss. So alopecia areata is a condition where the immune system in your skin attacks the follicles, causing the follicles to fall out. And you can see this condition in patients who have other autoimmune, autoimmune disease or inflammatory skin conditions like eczema or atopic dermatitis. So we typically manage that with topical steroids, injections of steroids into the scalp, and for those who have more complete or total scalp hair loss or body hair loss, term alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis respectively, patients like those may need oral systemic medications to calm down their immune system to bring their hair back. And for some of those folks, they have to stay on these medications in order to keep their hair there. And for other folks, they just deal with it and wear wigs or just sport the bald look and they're just completely okay with it. And then there are types of hair loss conditions that I see predominantly in African-American population. Um, this first condition, CCCA, is more of a scarring hair loss condition where uh, patients experience hair loss that typically starts in the middle of the scalp. And for a lot of these patients, they can experience tingling, itching, burning sensations of the scalp. And then when the hair falls out, a lot of times the scalp turns into scar tissue. So it prevents the hair from growing back um, where the hair had fall, fall out, fallen out if it's not treated adequately. And then there's traction alopecia where there's hair loss and thinning primarily along the frontal hairline of the scalp from chronic pulling and tension of the, uh, of the hair into styles that are tight like braids or weave styles that kind of pull and chronic tension on the frontal hairline. Now, traction alopecia is more of a non-scarring alopecia when you're compare, comparing scarring versus non-scarring alopecia, as I mentioned before. But if it's allowed to go on chronically, then it can become a scarring alopecia where it can be quite difficult to get the hair to grow back in the areas with tension. And just like with the uh, uh, alopecia areata, these two alopecias are also treated with topical steroids, injection of steroids, and sometimes pills to modulate the immune system to shut, that, shut down that inflammatory response in the skin. Another common condition I see in my, in my practice is seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, seborrhea is a condition where the skin reacts to yeast on the skin, which causes a dysregulation of the sebaceous glands and the yeast that interacts with the sebum or oil in the skin can cause this kind of flaky dandruff-like rash that's predominantly seen around the nose, um, the nasal labial folds within the brows. And as you can see in the patient on the right, you can see some hypopigmentation or loss of pigment along his hairline. Uh, but in the patient on the left, you see more red. So again, when you're dealing with patients of color, it may not look like what you're used to seeing in, in fair skin patients with the erythema and the scale. In patients of color, you may see just lightening of the skin and, and maybe a little bit of erythema. But again, if you can you see in the two pictures, the pattern of this rash is very important because seborrhea likes to affect the medial brows around the nose, nasal labial folds and the um, hairline around the ears. It just loves those areas and those areas are, are very high in sebum production. So that's where it tends to show up in a lot of patients. So that's just a, just a kind of form of uh, what I just discussed. You can see it in kids too and babies, cradle cap is the same thing. It's just the, the, their reaction to yeast on their skin. And the, uh, it can be a cutaneous sign of HIV infection. So if you have a patient with severe onset of seborrheic dermatitis just came out of nowhere as an adult, then that's one thing you kind of want to be thinking about. Do I need to check the HIV status in this patient? And we usually treat this very easily with topical anti-yeast shampoos, creams, um, topical steroids as needed for flares, and occasionally or antifungal medications for those with very severe breakouts of their seborrhea or difficult to control seborrhea.
So moving on into skin cancers, um, out of all the things I see in my practices, thankfully it's not something I see very common, but I do see several cases a month of skin cancers um, that walk in. And the three most common types of skin cancers that we see are basal cell skin cancers, squamous cell and melanomas, which are the least common of what I see. Uh, what well, most of us see in our practice at that. So these two photos are patients of color who have basal cell skin cancers on their nose. And what I wanted to include patients of color with this photo in particular, because many people, and even those of color, don't think that they can get skin cancer, but it does happen. And unfortunately, when patients of color get skin cancer, they tend to have the worst outcomes because they may not think it's a skin cancer. Some people say they, they think it's a pimple that just won't go away and they allow it to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And very rarely these cancers can metastasize to your lymph nodes and other parts of your body and, and put you in a really bad position if not caught early. And here are some other folk pictures of basal cell skin cancers and fair skin types. As you can see, they look pretty similar. They are pearly, we call these pearly papules. And typically you can see in picture A and D, you can see some of the blood vessels are very prominent um, within the basal cell. And that's another top, you know, sign that this is, you know, the clinical diagnosis is a basal cell when you see those big, we call arborizing vessels within the tumor. And for some folks, these cancers can ulcerize or ulcerate, excuse me. So in, in picture B and E, you see that this is taken over, especially in E, it's taken over the, the ear in this patient. And, and again, you know, patients can have something on their body, not even know it's bad. They might think it's just something like a sore that just won't heal. And they come in thinking it's a skin infection when in fact it's a skin cancer. And, um, you know, basal cells can locally invade and overgrow normal tissue and uh, removing them can be a uh, you know, very large task for some patients, especially in this person, um, in patient E, where they will likely have half of their ear removed trying to get the skin cancer taken out. And then squamous cell skin cancers look a little different from basal cells. They tend to be uh, more pink, not pearly, more crusted, especially in the center. And sometimes they kind of look a little warty. And out of the two skin cancers, basal cells and squamous cells together, they tend to erupt in places where patients have had constant sun exposure. So the lower lip, because it sticks out, the nose, the scalp, and guys who have thinning hair or balding, or balding and typically you see this in patients who have a just long-term history of either tanning or working outside for most of their life. So you see a lot of farmers who come in with growing skin cancers in places like on their lips and the top of their scalp. And then melanoma is the least common of the three, but can be the hardest to, com to clear completely. Because if you can treat a melanoma by cutting out the tissue, taking margins around the skin, sometimes there, are, there is metastasis that's not picked up with the size the tumor. And for some unfortunate patients, they can present to their primary care physician or dermatologist 10 or 20 years later um, after finding out they have mets to their liver or their brain from a melanoma that was cut out, com apparently completely cut out many, many years prior. So catching a melanoma early is very, very important. But as you can see, this is a melanoma on the cheek on a fair skin patient. Again, this is probably from chronic sun damage, sun exposure over time. Um, but unfortunately, melanoma is one of those types of skin cancers that doesn't have to pop up in an area that has been chronically exposed to the sun. This is a type of melanoma called acral melanoma, where it can pop up on the feet, the hands, the bottom of the foot, where there's been no sun exposure, but genetically, this patient has been predisposed to developing this type of skin cancer. And unfortunately, skin cancers in these areas, especially on the feet, can go unnoticed for a long, long period of time because most people don't look at the bottom of their feet. They might touch it or you know, moisturize it, clean it, but they're not actively looking on the bottom of their feet in between their toes to check for suspicious skin lesions. So um, when I do my full body skin exams on my patients, I, I do look at the bottom of the feet in between the toes. And even places like the buttocks, genitals, if, if the patient's comfortable because skin cancers can pop up there as well. And here's a picture of an acral um, or nail melanoma where you can see the hyperpigmentation is within the nail starting at the nail matrix where that blue circle is 
that's called the Hutchinson sign. And it's, you know, basically just means that there's hyperpigmentation of the skin where the pigment is forming in the nail. And that's a sign that this is likely a melanoma and not a benign lesion. Because in, in Blacks, there are normal cases of pigment within the nail that's not skin cancer. They, there's just this hyperpigmentation. And just like you can get a mole in your, your hand, your chest, or any place on your body, you can get moles within the nail too. And it shows up as a dark streak within the nail. But if you see hyperpigmentation all along the skin, at the base of the nail, or even at the pulp, the distal finger, then and especially with um, nicking in this nails, you can see and dy dystrophy and, and destruction of the nail, then that should raise your suspicion of this is not just a normal, normal sign, something else is going on here. Uh, so th this is the most common subtype of melanoma found in Blacks and Asians, about one third of all nail melanoma cases. Uh, so as I mentioned before, it tends to be more advanced at the time of diagnosis, with lower survival rates and poorer outcomes. But um, I wanted to include a picture of a nail that has a normal dark streak. So as you can see at the base of this nail, there is no hyperpigmentation of the skin at the nail fold, um, but there is a little dark streak there. And that's, that's normal. We see that in, all the time in patients of color. But if you are not sure you have the streaks in your nail, you have family members with streaks in the nail, you just want them to get checked. There's nothing wrong with going to see the dermatologist, having, letting us have a look and just to be sure everything looks good. So surgical derm is, you know, one, another one of the fun things I like about dermatology is that we can spend a couple patients talking about acne and seborrhea and hair loss. But every now and then I have a patient who comes in with a suspicious lesion and we do a biopsy on the spot. So biopsies are typically shave biopsies using a razor blade, as you can see in this video that I'll play in just a second. But we also do punch biopsies uh, where we take more, a deeper specimen to sample underneath where you can see the lesion. And then we even perform excisions of skin cancer, cysts, atypical moles on uh, any given day. So, you know, on my day, I might see an acne at nine o'clock and, and, and be cutting out a basal cell skin cancer at 11 o'clock. So my day is very variable. And um, again, like I said, it's never a dull moment. So I just want to show you a few seconds of this shea biopsy video so you can kind of give an idea of how we do a shea biopsy. This patient has been anesthetized with a lot of cane, um, likely with a little bit of epinephrine in it. We take the shade blade with an attempt to completely remove the lesion, especially if it's dark like that. If you don't remove the entire lesion and it turns out to be a melanoma, you have not, you have not given the pathologist enough skin to sample to be sure that it's truly melanoma and not something else. So um, when you do see a dark spot, we do like to remove the entire lesion. But if that spot was several centimeters in size, I would like to just kind of remove a small piece of it that looks most suspicious for skin cancer and send that off for testing. And then this is an example of a punch biopsy. So we use a tool called the punch tool. And after numbing up the, met the patient again with lidocaine, uh, we use the instrument to go around the lesion. Let's see, there we go. And Basically, she or he is sampling the entire lesion, just like you would in a shea biopsy. But just in case this spot comes back as an atypical mole, the dermatologist is removing the entire um, specimen. So if it does come back atypical, rest assured, we don't have to go back and take out more skin if we took enough margins of normal skin and a deeper specimen to remove the entire lesion. So the punch biopsy comes into play when we, when we want to remove a lesion in, in its entirety. And then you have an excision where it's definitely a lot more involved. Um, more than likely, this lesion turned out to be a skin cancer or an atypical mole. The surgeon has drawn margins around this atypical or cancerous lesion. Um, depending on what the cancer is, we take larger margins. If it was a melanoma, the margin would be a lot larger than that. Uh, so this is probably an atypical mole or basal cell squamous cell skin cancer. And you draw in a, like a football shape area around that circle so that when you do close the lesion or close the excision site, you are able to close it in a straight line. So uh, you see the dermatologist here 
using a scalpel to cut down to the subcutaneous fat. And when you get down to the subcutaneous fat, then you know that you have gotten underneath the lesion more than likely. Most skin cancers do not go beyond the fat. So we remove the area in its entirety and Dr. Tran will put that into a specimen cup and send it off to back to the lab for testing. And then once he has cut out or she has cut out the entire lesion, looks like he's or she is nicking it to um, let the pathologist know which, how to orient the, the, the specimen. Uh, just in case the margins come back positive, they will know where to go back to take out more tissue in this patient. And here the position is loosening up the wound edges so that when it's time to close up the wound, the skin is loose and not very tight. So usually we start with a, a dermal stitch right in the middle to close the wound up and relieve the tension on either side. And then we end up putting more dermal stitches along the edges of the wound. As you I'm know, just gonna fast forward because it can be a little long. So once you are done putting in the dermal sutures, then you close up the remaining epidermal skin with superficial with stitches that are to be removed about 10 to 14 days after the stitches are placed if you are doing an excision on the trunk or extremities. And this looks like an, an area that's really thick. So this is probably the back on the patient. I love doing excisions, they're fun. Oops. That wasn't supposed to happen, so let me go back. All right, perfect. And then you have cosmetic dermatology. Now, it's a very small portion of what we learn in the residency, but as you'll find in some places, especially like California, Miami, Florida, there's a lot of cosmetic dermatologists. Like they, they don't even see acne or skin checks. They just do all cosmetics. And that we learn about Botox, fillers, peels, lasers um, in residency. Some residencies have more of a heavy cosmetic focus than others, but it, in general, cosmetic dermatology is not something that we focus a lot on in dermatology residency. So those who you, that you may see practicing more cosmetic dermatology in um, the community typically kind of learn, go beyond the residency and, and pick up more training to be able to do more of these procedures and to feel more comfortable with doing them in all skin types. So that is it for just kind of an overview of dermatology and what I do. So I just have a few slides to kind of focus on advice for pre-meds pre and just starting with undergrad. When it comes to your GPA, the most important part of your GPA is keeping that science GPA high. And this is something that medical school admission directors and uh, people on staff look for, that high science GPA. Now, when I finished my undergraduate schooling, I took a gap year between college and medical school. I did not apply to medical school my senior year. I, I waited because I wanted to increase my science GPA. So I said, I, I'm not gonna risk it. I, I don't care if I have to take a gap year. I wanna make sure I get into medical school the first go around. So I did take a gap year so I can study harder and raise up my uh, GPA for my undergraduate, my science GPA from college. Also, I took the MCAT twice. I wasn't satisfied with my first score. Um, the MCAT is the medical school admissions test. And they use that as a way to kind of you know, field who to invite to interviews or not for some schools. So I took it twice and quite honestly, my second score was one point higher than the first score. So I was still, still wasn't satisfied, but I was like, you know what, I'm not taking this test again because it's really hard and it's really time consuming. And if I could go back in time, I would prepare a little better because I, I didn't really um, have a good idea of what it took to take the MCAT, I would have started doing test questions my freshman year of college. I would have just started right then and there and taken as many practice tests as possible, even if I bombed all of them. Because it, you, the MCAT is an exam that is unlike any exam that you'll ever take in your life. And they test you on things that you don't really learn, like you learn in undergraduate school, but you don't really prepare for in college. So if you can afford to take courses to prepare you for the MCAT, that will be 
a great too, to kind of give you a little edge as far as preparing for the exam. But if you can't take the course because they can they can be really expensive, then to do as many test exam questions as possible because those can be expensive too, paying for the test. Um, but that would be a good way to prepare you for the MCAT. Also, another thing I didn't really think about is your personal statement. You know, you already know why you want to become a doctor while you're in college for the most part. So start working on your personal statement and you can find uh, personal statement questions online to kind of prepare you for what's asked. And it's basically a story of why you want to become a physician and you want to stand out. You want to be personal and you want to be well written. So start working on it now and and share it with your family members, share it with your mentors. If you have a counselor in college, share it with them to get as many um, areas of feedback as possible so that you can perfect it. And when it's time to submit your ap application for medical school, that will be the last thing you have to worry about because that can take be the most time consuming part if you're not you know, ready. Now, MSAR stands for Medical School Admissions Requirement. It is a basically a book or PDF if you buy it online with a list of all the medical schools in the country. And it will tell you basic information about the medical school, like the tuition. But the most important thing that you can take from the MSAR is the average GPA, science GPA, and the average MCAT score for those medical schools. So if your MCAT scores, you know, I don't know what the average is now because it's changed so much since I last took it. But if you score at a certain number and you want to know if you're competitive to go to Albany State Medical School, you can look up that school within the MSAR. And if their average is, you know, a score of 40 for the MCAT and you're way down at 30, 25, then you may not be as competitive to, to receive an interview um, request for that school. So it kind of gives you an idea of where you kind of fit as far as how competitive your scores, your GPA is compared to the students that they normally admit. It's only $28 for a year. And it's probably going to be one of the best $28 you'll spend in preparation for getting into medical school. Further, whenever you are know you're, you're about to start applying to med school and you know the schools you want to apply to, get your application ready like months in advance. You don't want to be scrambling to send in your medication, your application, excuse me, at the last minute, because as soon as they open that first date to accept applications, they are going to start sending out interview um, request for you to come and in be interviewed at their school. So if you wait until the end of the interview cycle to send in your application, nine times out of 10, that school has already picked the people in their class that they want to come join their, their, their next entering class. So be the first application that they see, because if the earlier you are in there, the, the earlier they'll be looking at your application and determining whether to extend the uh, interview invitation. And for those schools that have secondary applications, don't use template essays for your secondary application. And that just means don't copy and paste and send it to all the medical schools for their secondary. Because these, these medical school admissions people, they know, they talk to each other, they know each other. So they could very well be talking about you uh, in the background. And if, and if you send in a template essay for uh, Medical College of Georgia, and you forgot to take out MUSC, the Medical University of South Carolina name out of your template essay, that can look really, really bad. I mean, it could just taint your whole application. So don't use template essays, don't copy and paste, just create a totally new essay for that school and um, make sure you, you read, double check, reread, and before you hit submit. Further, you want to create a separate professional email account for communicating with your mentors, medical schools, et cetera. Um, if you want to use your school email, then that's fine. You just want to make sure it's professional and you want to make sure it's an account that you will have access to even when you graduate. Because you may want to go back and have access to these, your files or you know, your email exchanges with people from your past. So it's good to have a separate professional email account and nothing with any crazy names, nicknames, nothing like that. Just try to keep it as professional as possible in this day and age. Uh, and then I also mentioned before, volunteering at a local primary care office while you're in college is ideal. Get to know the doc and the better you get to know them, the more likely they'll be able to write you a strong letter of recommendation. So when you do ask for LORs, you ask that person, can you write a strong one? And if they can't 
if they say they cannot write a strong LOR for you, then don't accept it. You want strong letters of recommendation. You don't want weak or mediocre letters. You want strong ones. And uh, another thing that, and some a lot of this advice uh, I took from my husband, who actually used to be a uh, you know, over a medical school admission program. So a lot of this information is coming from him. So he said, look, make sure you look if you qualify for the AAMC fee assistance program. It can be expensive to apply to multiple medical schools. I mean. I, I was looking at one of the presentations from before and I saw that a derm the last dermatologist who presented applied to a hundred medical schools. I'm like, that had to be super expensive. I mean, it's, uh, in my, back in my day, my application fees were probably 30 to $50 per application. I can't imagine how much it is now and then multiply times a hundred, my goodness. So if you think you qualify uh, or even if you don't know if you qualify, just apply to see if you can get assistance for paying for your medical school uh, applications because it can get very expensive and every little bit counts. That money that you spend that you can potentially save could be used towards buying books, um, you know, paying tuition, et cetera. Oh, and then apply to all of your state schools. I know, especially in Georgia, I've, I've spoke, you know, had conversations with mentees who are like, I don't want to stay in Augusta, where Medical College of Georgia is. I don't want to leave. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go to another state. And I'm telling you, tuition is lower in state. I don't care what medical school you go to. You're still going to have the MD or DO behind your name when you finish. That no one's going to look at your CV or resume and say, oh, my gosh, he, you know, he went to MUSC or Mercer or USC. I don't know, you know whatever. They're not going to look at that and think that you're not qualified to be a medical doctor. So stay in state. And especially if your parents are paying for this, like give them a break and go to an in-state school where they don't have to pay so much money for you to stay. Um, and then. And then another thing is that it may increase your chances of getting into medical school if you go to an in-state school, because these schools have funding allocated to residents of that state. So they're more likely to accept you than an out-of-state student. They will accept out-of-state students, of course, but they're more likely to accept in-state students because they want you to finish medical school and practice in, in their state. I, don't, I know that's the case for Georgia. I'm sure that's the case for other states too. Because we want, we need, we need physicians. We need specialists. Um, we need as much access to care as possible for our for our um, citizens. So moving on to the interview, and again, to me, this seemed you know common sense. But according to my husband, this is not common sense for some people. Dress conservatively for interviews. Like this is not a fashion show. We don't need to go out trying to impress your competition or trying to impress the people interviewing you because at the end of the day, you don't want them to remember what you had on. You don't want that to be the topic of conversation when they are sitting down amongst each other with your file, um, discussing whether or not you need, they want to admit you to their school or not. So keep it simple, keep it plain. Don't stand out, don't show cleavage, don't, don't wear mini skirts. Like just keep it as simple as possible. If you have piercings in your nose, two, three, four pierces in your ears, take them out, keep it simple. One earring in each ear is fine. And um, keep your jewelry on your hands simple, one ring, one watch. Just, just don't try not to stand out because that's not, that's not what this is about, okay? And when it comes to the interview, you wanna treat everyone you come in contact with as soon as you pull into that parking lot or parking deck as if they are part of the interview because you don't know who knows who at that institution, all the way down to, to the custodian. Um, my husband was telling me a story about a student who was very rude to the custodian in their office. And that custodian knew him very well. And based on that, that interaction that the custodian had, they decided not to invite that person back for a secondary interview or just to be admitted to the class. So you just never know. You are interviewing until you leave that parking deck and you're no longer talking to anyone at that institution. Okay. So that is pretty much it for me. Uh, any questions or thoughts? All right. Um, Jasmine wants to know, uh, 
Do you have any advice on finding research opp opportunities related to dermatology um, to do over in summer? And she's a high school senior from Atlanta, Georgia as well, so. Oh, hello. So yeah, I mean, high school, it's, it's interesting. I, I, when I was in high school in Augusta, I was actually looking for opportunities to um, be in more of a connection with the faculty at the medical college there. And they had programs set up to introduce us to careers in, in medicine. And through that program and interacting with people who are affiliated with the medical school, if I wanted to do research, all I had to do was reach out to the mentors in that program who would then reach out to potential mentors at the medical school who could put me on research projects to, to do while I was an, an, a high school student. So, you know, you're in Atlanta, so you have access to Emory, Morehouse School of Medicine, um, individuals there. And, you know, I'll provide my, my contact information at the end of the slide. I have my Instagram handle there. So if you have any questions or concerns or, or kind of more specific questions on how to kind of get in that network, just shoot me a message and I can you know, figure out what I can do for you. But it's all about knowing people and getting in connection with those people. And just like I mentioned, volunteering at hospitals, local phys physician offices, you, when you make those connections with those people, they almost always know someone who knows someone who knows someone who can get you to that right person to kind of get you on a research project or something where you can start to build up your CV for applying to um, medical school and beyond. All right, uh, thank you for that. Um, Kate wants to know what made you stand out or what were some of the important qualities that you had um, that were successful in getting you to medical school ap application? Sure, good question, Kate. So I believe being a well-rounded person helped me to stand out as far as my medical school application was concerned. I think that what happens to a lot of folks is that they kind of follow this narrow path of just going into biology and pre-med and that's that's all they do they don't do anything else outside of college and it can make you look like a just kind of a one-dimensional person and medical schools are looking for multi-dimensional people people who are well-rounded people who volunteer people who work people who travel who have interests outside of medicine because being a doctor is not the end all. Like you have to be more than just a doctor to be able to connect with your patients, to be able to reach your patients on a level that um, people who are not multidimensional can't reach because patients are looking to connect with their physicians. They're looking to uh, connect with them on a level that, that builds trust, that builds um, you know, trust in that person among the other things. And if, and if you're not a person that's kind of well-rounded and, and have other experiences and, and don't have that connection with the real world, then it can, it can make you not seem like a good fit for the medical school. Uh, so being a well-rounded person, just kind of having other interests outside of medicine is important. Because if you lose yourself as a physician, it's easy to get burned out and to become resentful um, towards practicing medicine and, and helping people. So I think just being a well-rounded person helped help my application in the end of the day. All right. Um, Matthew wants to know, is it common to see like severe cases of skin cancer as patients might misdiagnose themselves before coming in for a treatment? Hi, Matthew. It's not very common, but it does happen. And I have taken off skin cancers as large as a softball in the past. And I don't, I, I don't understand why patients wait so long to get them treated. And typically they're, they're patients that come from more rural areas. So they're busy working hard to provide for their families. So they may not see a little bump that's bleeding and won't heal as a problem, especially if it's been there for years but they'll let it grow and they'll keep babying it. They'll keep taking care of it, keep, keep keeping it covered with a bandage. And then one day they just decide like enough is enough. I have to get this taken care of because it's not going away. And for some folks, they'll come in with their nose completely just obliterated by skin cancer. And some people are just scared. Like they don't want to know that it's cancerous. They don't want to 
have to undergo surgery. They, they don't want to know, be told that it's metastasized to their lymph nodes and brain. So sometimes fear keeps people away. Uh, so it's not common that I do see that, but it, I, I do see it enough. And I, 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 um, I do see it enough. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kid wants to know, like, what would you do differently, if anything, thinking back on your path to medicine? Um, I know you briefly talked about taking, studying for MCAT a little bit earlier, uh, but what uh, are some other things that you wish uh, you could have done differently? I wish I would have reached out to more potential mentors in medicine or the medical field and just built more connections that way. Because it come, for me, I'm coming from a uh, family, a household where my parents did not go to college. They went straight into the military from high school and, and worked low to middle income jobs to provide for us. So I didn't have a lot of mentors to kind of guide me through the process of becoming a physician. So a lot of times I honestly kind of was just playing it by ear. Honestly, I, I, I was just, you know, I would look on Google for what it was worth back then. There was no student doctor network back then. So I was just kind of just going along and it's amazing that I kind of ended up in this position because it does take a lot to get to where I am today. But I wish I had reached out to more mentors. So there were mentors out there who could have kind of took me in their wings and guided me along the way. And I feel like I would have been more prepared. I would have done better on the MCAT if I had started studying sooner. Uh, and, you know, who knows what else would have changed if I kind of had more guidance. So don't hesitate to reach out to those who could potentially guide you through the process. And it'll be a lot smoother process, hopefully for you having some people along the way who can tell you, you know, what you should do, what you shouldn't do and how you should do it. Um, Amrin wants to know, uh, because of the step one being pass and fail now, do you think dermatology residents placement would be more connection based? It would be more helpful or it would be more helpful to go to a medical school with a dermatology department or separate research experience with dermatology? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, Amreen. You know, that's something that started after I took the um, step one exam. So of course, you know, there's no number to screen applicants by as far as, you know, when applying derm residency is concerned. So I'm sure they'll be looking more at your, the rest of your application, your GPA, your board school, um, your, not your board scores, uh, unless you have step two in there as well. Um, they'll be looking at your research, how much community service work you have done, and they'll be looking at your application as a whole. So you will no longer use that number to screen people. So it will be more important to kind of make sure the rest of your application, your CV is, is built up around that, you know, step one score so that you can stand out more when it comes to uh, competing with other derm applicants, but you know that, that's something I have to look more into. Let uh, me have to ask one of my colleagues who still serves on the admissions for dermatology residency programs. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how they are grading applicants now, but as I mentioned before, it will be um, you know at your best interest to shadow or spend time at other dermatology residency programs. Uh, not, not your own, because of course at your own, they already know you. So they're going to offer you a spot at their program if they, if they like you. But it'd be good to spend more time at a Durham residency program so that you can increase your chances of be, being offered a seat at, you know, in their program um, at the end of the day. As, you know, they will just want to know that they can work with you and that you're a great person to work with and you're, you're, you're a hard worker and you're dedicated and you're smart, obviously, because you're, you're applying to dermatology. So yeah, doing derma wave rotations will be good just to kind of help give you an extra leg on those who didn't do a derma wave rotation at those institutions who are still applying. Um, Jasmine wants to know, would you recommend looking at MCAT practice questions slash studying for the MCAT the summer before first year of college. I've heard other pre-med college students and st students in medical school saying to take the actual classes first, but uh, I wanted to hear your opinion on it. it. Well, if you start studying before you get into college or taking test questions, it may be a little daunting because of some of the material you probably haven't been introduced to in high school, unless you took some advanced 
science, math courses, AP courses in um, your senior year of high school that could potentially prepare you, start preparing you for the MCAT. So starting the summer before you start college may be a little premature, but if you, you know, by all means, if you have the money and you have the time, then get started because the earlier, the better. Thank you. So I'm gonna speak one time. I'll do one last question. Um, okay. So Samson wants to know, how did you go about finding ways to get relevant experience like sharing or working in a hospital or even research? Sure, Samson. Well, when I was in college, I, you know, all hospitals have a shadowing program. Well, most of them do, I'm sure, uh, especially in cities where there are medical schools and big universities um, located like Atlanta. So I just Google searched the Grady Hospital Volunteer Program and let them know I was pre-med and was interested in spending some time with the, um, the physicians. And they asked me what area of the hospital I wanted to work in. I told them the ER because I knew I would see a lot of cool cases there. And that's how I got into um, shadowing the, in the emergency room at Grady. And then when I was working at the Georgia Aquarium, you know, a lot of my colleagues there knew I wanted to become a physician. And my one person in particular you know, suggested shadowing her primary care physician. She says she's great, she's nice, and she'll let you shadow her. I didn't even ask her, uh, you know, if I could shadow her PCP. She just kind of came out of nowhere and, and suggested that I could, could shadow her primary care doctor or reach out to her and to see if she'd be open to it. So I did, and that's where I got one of my letters, letters of recommendation, shadowing a PCP here in the Atlanta area. So like I said, it's, you know, sometimes it boils down to who you know, and other times it boils down to just reaching out, doing the research and, and, and getting in where you can get some experience and start meeting some doctors who can, you know, reach out to their colleagues and see if you can shadow other doctors and other specialties. So it's it just, you know, it can always just start with one person. And then from there, you know, the possibilities are endless. Awesome. Thank you very much, doctor. Um, since uh, I think we went a little bit over time, but I and from everyone, like I would like to thank you for coming and giving such an informative and inspiring presentation. Um, just in terms of like the health disparities you see and everything like that was so enlightening. And I think as a healthcare practitioner in future, like I think it's definitely as you mentioned to see the different, uh, even though the skin color tones and just how the medical diagnosis might be different. So that was, I think, really eye-opening for me. And in the chat too, like um, everyone's like, thank you for answering the questions and being here uh, today and enlightening us with the field of dermatology. Um, for everyone else, um, we do uh, not have an assessment today. So we just have like a verification form. So if you fill it that out, that would guarantee your participation points for today. And as doctor, if you always want to follow Dr. Richardson, uh, she has her information on the screen. Uh, definitely feel free to ask for more help or more directions if you guys didn't get a chance to ask the questions today. Um, and to, uh, not tomorrow, but on the, our, our upcoming e sharing session will be happening on April 21st at 12 p.m. Pacific time with Dr. Haley Bourne, who will be talking more on the field of otolaryngology. Uh, we would thank you all for joining us. And again, I would like to thank Dr. Vanessa Richardson for taking her time to come and speak with us and enlightening us with her knowledge on dermatology. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Thank you guys for your attending the session. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll see you guys on next session.